So the key to all of this, so the key to all of this is um, oh how do I accept this? Sorry, I think I'm to accept. Yeah, okay. Is um, having a Hamiltonian, and um, I have purposefully written uh, not the temperature here, but um, parameter there, gamma, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so what we do in our lab, we actually work on both sides of this, that slight downside, where we are actually applying basically Boltzmann law to model intrinsically disordered proteins. And I will get to that in a second, what do I mean by those? And um, in that case, we are taking the problem from Coarse grain Hamiltonian, where you can actually have analytical theory to all atom um, aspect of it. Uh, we also, and today I'm gonna mostly talk about the coarse grain side of intrinsically disordered protein story, uh, but we also actually work on the climb up side. And in that case, we actually try to figure, tackle non-thermal problems, um, which are yet amenable to this Boltzmann kind of uh, laws. And we try to find out what's the effective Hamiltonian for this kind of non-thermal problem. And in that case, this gamma, which is usually beta one over KBT for the thermal problem is a Lagrange multipliers. And this is at the borderline of information theory and stat make where we are straddling. And uh, we are tackling many problems in that area. But one of the most common one is when you have noisy time series data, such as gene expression. So in that side, it is a bit of an inference problem. If you have the data, try to figure out what the Hamiltonian would be. Um, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today. Okay, so get to the business of IDPs. These are intrinsically disordered protein. That's the full form of that and a very brief background on what IDPs are. Um, we all must probably know what are the folded proteins where you basically have a unique folded structure. Uh, for IDPs, you do not have um, unique folded structure. You basically what you have is a disordered state and an ensemble of these states and it's constantly dancing around and shuttling between all these disordered conformations, okay? And you can see that basically screams Boltzmann law, right? And this is where we physicists have something to contribute to. All right, so just because these are disordered does not mean the details of the sequence, that is how these amino acids are connected is not important. Even in the disordered ensemble, there are footprints or fingerprints of sequence. So just to give you an example, uh, I'm gonna show you some all atom simulation result here. Let's consider the end-to-end -end distance of this protein or polymer chain. And if you do the ensemble average of that for a protein, which I write as 00877, which is not important, and you have a mutation at residue 41 from aspartic acid to lysine, uh, this end-to-end -end distance is about 40 angstrom. However, if you have a different mutation at a different location, instead of 41, if you have four, and uh, why do I choose these DNAs? Because these are both negatively charged and K is positively charged. So basically between the red and the cyan sequence, you have same number of positive and negative charges, and they really vary in one position where that extra positive charge shows up, right? And you can see there could be a wide difference in the size. Okay, so what I also want to say, this sequence, what I just told you in the context of the size and conformation is also important in the function, uh, IDPs, participate in signaling, in phase separation. And here is an example among many cases where the sequence matters. This is a wild type protein. Um, what's important here is the red and the blue lines. The red are, one of them is the plus charge, one of the other one is the minus charge where these are located. Then they created a chart scramble version of this wild type sequence where you have same number of blues and reds as the wild type N1, but shuffled in different order. And basically what happens, 
uh, the wild type sequence, the N, phase separates, and the chart scramble one does not phase separate. Okay. All right. Um, so at a very high level, what is happening is for the folded proteins, what we need to, you were used to thinking you have a sequence, you have a structure and you have a function. And now we have this new paradigm, you have sequence, ensemble of conformations and function. And what our lab is trying to do here is this idea of sequence, it's trying to mathematically characterize by some functions that depend on the sequence of amino acids. Okay, that's basically the holy grail and it's trying to use Hamiltonian based approach to do this and get this kind of mathematical relations. Um, so how do we study this? I mean, very broadly, there are new experimental tools from single molecule threat uh, to you know, all atom simulations, but today, and we are doing all atom simulation, we are comparing against experiment, but what I'm gonna talk about today is um, analytical theory using coarse grain Hamiltonian. And one key thing coming back to this whole idea of sequence is proteins are not homopolymers, right? So we have amino acids that are different um, and the sequence matters. And that's what we're gonna capture in our modeling. So at the bottom, what I'm showing you two pictures where you have same number of red, green, blue, orange, pink balls. Those are different types of amino acids, but their ordering matters, okay? Okay. so. And most of the existing theories are for homopolymer. We're gonna do this for heteropolymer where the building blocks are different and the ordering is respected. So the basic Hamiltonian has to have some very basic elements and I'm showing this pictorially, but I'll show you mathematically also what these terms are. So I'm gonna show the mathematical form of the Hamiltonian and it's not so important to get into all the details of the math, but just to get the idea of what are these different terms. This is the, the first term in this complicated Hamiltonian is the chain connectivity. The fact that it's a polymer chain, things are connected, you have covalent bonding. Then what we do, we have an interaction term that is two different amino acids are interacting with each other. And that's a two body term. Um, I'm showing you that pictorially above and mathematically what that would be in below. We also add a three body term repulsive. So the polymer cannot collapse to a point. We don't have an equivalent problem of what happens to the Bohr, um, what happens of the collapse. And then the last term is the electrostatic term. And if it helps, you can look at the above the pictorial one where basically different charges are <clears throat> interacting with Coulomb's law. Okay, <clears throat> so equipped with this key physics of these four terms, we can actually do quite a bit. And that's kind of my main message today. So what we can do from the Hamiltonian, first what we do, we want to rewrite it in an effective Hamiltonian. You still have to re respect the fact that it's a polymer. So things are connected like a chain. And what you do, you see, I have now something like L, in the effective Hamiltonian, subscript R. And that's like a renormalized bond length. And all the sequence specificity gets lumped into that term. And where do I have sequence specificity? If you look up in the Hamiltonian, the second term, you see I have QS, QS prime. That's the charge at amino acid S and S prime. And we're working in the continuum model, but that's not so important right now. That makes just the math easier. So that's where the sequence specificity will come in. Okay, so when we do all this calculation at the end of the day, when the dust settles, you can basically write a free energy. It's a function of X and this X will be related to the size. And I'll get to that in a second. What is critical here is the last term you see, the Q term, and that's where the electrostatics is embedded. And how does that actually, and we call that term sequence charge decoration. It's a measure of how the charges are decorated in the sequence. And what does that do? So imagine this is my polymer chain I have drawn and you have charges at M and N given by QM, QN, that's in that term. And their sequence separation is M minus N. And then you need to sum it over all these different amino acids. Okay. 
And coming back to, so that's where the sequence specificity enters and coming back to the idea of the size or X, what is that? You minimize this free energy at a given X and then whatever that X is, if you put that with N being the number of amino acids, B being like a bond length, usually some fixed angstrom, that's gonna give you your ensemble average end to end distance, okay? All right, so that's how from theory we can do this for different sequences. So we need to test this. Um, what we're gonna do, we're gonna take this kind of sequences originally designed by Das and Papu, where these E's are negative charges and K's are positive charges. These sequences are gonna have same number of positive and negative charges, 25, 25, but shuffled in different order, as you can see from this example. Uh, so Das Papu already did the simulation of these 30 different sequences, which is in the Y axis. And in the X axis, I'm showing you the results from our theory. And as you can see, the theory is capturing fairly well the distinction in size because of this charge patterning. And actually, if you want to go back and see what's the culprit in the theory to capture this is really this sequence charge decoration term. As the shuffling changes, this Q captures that metric. So if we actually directly plot the simulated size in the Y axis against this SCD parameter, you see a very nice dependence. Okay. So, but you know, you, these are very twice sequences. They have nothing to do with real protein-like sequences. So if we actually go to real disordered proteins, <clears throat> I'll take an example and let's get a bit closer to biology. So here is a wild type sequence. What you can do, you can phosphorylate sequences wherever you have the letters S or T. So let's say we have a sequence now here in green, which is gonna phosphorylate at location 54 and 56 and phosphorylation puts a negative charge, which we mimic by E. And now you can have a different sequence in red where you basically still phosphorylate two amino acids, but at a different location, two and 15. So basically this green and red sequence will have same number of plus and minus charges, only the location of two minus charges would be different between the green and the red, okay? So these are the locations. So now if we run our theory, this is what we're gonna get. We're gonna see a difference in size. So we did all atom simulation for this. And indeed you can see it captures the trend. There is a difference. Of course, all atom simulation has more bells and whistles. So the curves don't fall exactly on top of each other. But the main point is this with this theory, you can capture the difference. Okay. So, so far what I told you is the story about the end-to-end -end distance. But for a polymer, I can also measure distances between any two amino acids, as I'm showing you here, let's say I and J, any intermediate points I and J. So we can turn the crank. We can do this complicated theory again. It's gonna look a bit more messy. Um, the important part here to again notice the electrostatic part, and by the way, we're mostly focusing on the electrostatic part. This one doesn't look as pretty as before. Instead. It will have you know, multiple terms here. Okay, that's fine. Um, we don't necessarily need to look into all these different terms, um, but now we basically got a matrix of these kind of different patterning terms. Before I was looking into end-to-end, -end, so I had only one metric, which was SCD. Now, if I look at any IJ corresponding to whatever IJ I'm probing, I'm gonna get different type of charge patterning metric. And that's why we call it sequence charge decoration matrix. That's why the capital M. Uh, and the ensemble average distance between any two amino acid IJ is gonna be a function of this matrix. So you could be wondering where are these kind of terms coming from? So basically what is happening, you are probing at specific amino acid IJ. And then in the electrostatic, in the background, the context, you have sum over all these different amino acids. So you have a competition between these two different pairs of indices. And if you actually work through them, these are all these different terms. So these are actually exactly Feynman diagrams. And um, to quote Sam Edwards, by the way, the Hamiltonian I showed you was from Sam Edwards. Uh, 
he always used to say polymers are their own Feynman diagrams. These are actually very natural in polymers. Okay, so that's great. Okay, there is a lot of elegant theory there, but what's the point? So if you now finally put this together, you can actually give me the ensemble average size, size between any IJ, not just end to end. And that's what I'm trying to show you here in these figures. If you have a residue I and J, and then you take a point in this triangle I, J, you can draw the distance with a heat map. So the bottom triangle is the prediction of the theory for different, three different sequences. That's why you have three different graphs. The top triangle is the result of all atom simulation coming from um, taking a week. As you can see, the agreement is not exact, but it captures the theory. The bottom triangle captures a lot of salient features of the sequences that the all atom simulation captures, except the theory is a matter of seconds. Okay, so what are we doing with these ideas? Um, so basically, what gives rise to this kind of different patterns? Like you see these regions where it's very bright yellow, meaning it's very expanded, and dark red where it's more compact. So underneath, it's that electrostatic interaction map that dictates what's gonna happen. So you can go under the hood and you can actually check that SCDM, that matrix I was talking about. And you will see different regions have red and blue. The blue are the attractive regions, red are the repulsive regions, and those repulsive regions will correspond to bright yellow that is expansion. So these kind of diagrams are hallmarks or molecular bl blueprints of these proteins. Uh, so if we go back to that example I showed you earlier, that you have a wild type sequence, and now you can phosphorylate either at 54, 56, or at two and 15, before I showed you what happens to the end-to-end the -end distance difference between these two sequences. Now we can look at the whole distance profile between any IJ, what happens. So this one shows, if you phosphorylate at two and 15, the bottom triangle shows the pattern of the whole distance map. The top triangle shows the result from all atom simulation. Now notice if I have the different location of these changes, the bottom triangle is very different from the bottom triangle of the other one, right? So this basically again shows, depending on where you phosphorylate, you can have a drastic difference in conformation. And the top triangles are again, all atom simulation results just to show uh, the theory does pretty well. One other interesting thing is you can notice now I'm making a change basically at two and 15 which I'm showing by the green arrows. But now where I'm gonna do a red circle is where you are gonna have a dr drastic difference in the size. So this is a bit like an action at a distance kind of result, right? You can make a perturbation far away and you can still see this change at a distant location. So what we have been doing now, so this is all nice and good theory, but um, can we do this something for IDP's function? So in the remaining three to five minutes I have, let me just tell you the story of application of these ideas to function. So one of the problem with IDPs is these are, these sequences cannot be aligned very well, even if you have two functionally similar disordered proteins. And they also don't have structure, right? So you cannot do structural alignment either. So both the ideas that work for folded protein to de determine functionally similar proteins doesn't work here. So just to remind you, if you take functional proteins, these are different rows are functionally similar folded proteins. You align them and you will see very high conservation. These regions are highly conserved, but for IDPs, that's not the case. So I'm gonna illustrate example of an IDP called ST50. It's used in a different signaling pathway. So what is this STE50 protein? It has two folded domains on the left, SAM and RA, but the disordered domain is what I've drawn in the middle. If you collect that from many different organisms and try to align them, you can see it really is very poor. There are also regions of gaps and insertions, even the lengths are all over the place. And average alignment is about 20%. So that's to tell you the alignment idea doesn't work. 
So what they did in experiment, so they have this wild type disordered region on the top one. It has five phosphorylatable site. That's functional. Now, if you knock out those five phosphorylatable site and put alanine, the second row, it's non-functional. Now what they did is very interesting. They took that region from a different organism, put it back in the original organism, it becomes functional. And one of the, they have many different measures of functionality. One of the measurement is the size of these yeast cells, okay? All right, so basically this wild type is normal, the 5A is abnormal, and the l clue, which comes from a different organism is normal again. So even more interestingly, what they did, they then take two more sequences, has got nothing to do with this protein from other organisms. These were just some other IDPs. And one of them, this PEX5, and you can see their alignment with the original disordered region. Again, there is absolutely no alignment, but this PEX5 recovers the function, but the RAT26 does not. So now I have five sequences. The one in red do not capture the function. They're abnormal and the blues do work okay. So we thought, okay, so structural alignment doesn't do anything. Sequence alignment doesn't do anything. What about if we use these metrics that we got, these theoretical metrics of metrics? Can we find some similarity blueprint from there? So basically what we did, we took those metrics, we flattened it in 1D array for each one of these sequence. Then we did PCA and then we clustered them. And lo and behold, you can see the ones that are functional, they do fall, I'm showing you a dendrogram in one category and the non-functionals are in another one. So then you start to go back and you're like, okay, so what's going on here, right? So you look at that electrostatic map I showed you earlier. And if you actually look, the functional ones on the left, the three blue ones, their electrostatic map looks much similar than the non-functional ones. Um, so this is where we are trying to also take this idea now, use these patterning matrix to see if we can describe function. Um, also going back to the story, I will stop very soon or short in one minute. Um, the multi-chain problem, we're also, so far what I told you is the story about a single chain. If you have one polymer chain, but if you want to describe phase separation or solution behavior, you need to have multi-chain problem. So that's where the Hamiltonian is worse. You have to sum over all these different chains and, you know, but there are theoretical ways we can work this out. And that also has helped us to explain what I told you earlier. If we have two sequences with char scramble versus wild type, the char scramble does not phase separate. So we're trying to use this to calculate phase diagrams as well. So I am going to basically conclude saying these charge decoration matrices can be used to get size and they can be used to design. We basically, since those are fast, we design and tell our experimental colleagues to do experiments now. Um, they give you idea of distances. They can help you to understand function. So Hamiltonian based analytical theory can be useful. It's not all bogus. Um, these are, so on the left, Jonathan, we really did most of the work before and Taylor and Luke, some of our earlier students. And on the right, we have the group who are the top row of three of them are working on the slide down part of the problem. The bottom three are working on the slide up where the other story I didn't talk about, the stochastic dynamics and all that. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kings. I'll clap on behalf of the audience. <clears throat> we have one question from Robin. Uh, yes. Why does the SCD term increase with separation as N minus M to the power of half, even in the presence of screening? Oh, um, a good question. Um, so what I showed you is um, the CD term and SCDM and everything is at the zero salt limit. In the presence of salt, it actually becomes even more complicated. You have a SCD and then you have a correction terms that goes with salt. Um, so, and then we actually start to have something called, I'm really glad you asked this. Um, there is a term called SCD low salt. New metrics, new metrics appear, which actually tell you when you add salt, what's going to happen. 
is this actually going to expand or contract with salt? So all this SCD, low salt, SCD salt, SCDM, this is all at zero salt, but in the presence of salt, that matrix starts to become even more. So you start to break the degeneracy and you start to get even more richer and richer met metrics or matrices. Could, could I ask a second question? Mm, yeah. Ahead. Yeah. Um, towards the end, when you showed the maps, it looked like the SCD maps for functional proteins were much richer in information than the, yeah, the ones on the left. The functional ones look very rich in information in the red group pattern, and the non functional ones look low in information. They are just to, uh, 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 call it, uh, could you use information of the map as a measure of functionality? Yeah, we have not done that yet. Um, by the way, um, it's, but this is a very good point. Um, and I just showed you only story of one protein family here. We have done it for two other families for which there is data. And indeed it looks like uh, the non -fun well, in that case, you know, the question is whether it binds more or less, is a little less featureless than the functional ones. So um, you are absolutely right. We have not quantified that yet, but there could be room to do that, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, Dimitris Vavlonis has a question. Uh, thanks, would you say this is a kind of a mean field approach? Um, so I, maybe we should discuss this after the talk, uh, after mm -hmm. the hour. Uh, this is a um, mean field in some sense and mean field in not some sense. So it is definitely not mean field in the sense we are taking care of the sequence patterning. Um, but uh, if you want to say, for example, lumping everything in the sequence, uh, where is that slide, right? So this kind of treatment is still mean field, um, but um, previous theories, they basically don't take the sequence specificity. Um, and for the phase separation part, it's definitely not mean field. We are actually using random phase approximation uh, to capture dens density fluctuations and beyond random phase approximation. So, so I think it is a bit tricky. We need to talk about which level of model we're talking about. Um, and um, sorry, if I can just make one more point. It is also mean field in a sense, not as I said in the sequence, not in charge patterning, but in the non-charge patterning, we are assuming mean field. We pull, you see here, we have this sequence specificity, but we replace all of that by mean field term now for the non-charge side of it. Um, 